The Corvette was born out of a dire need at the beginning of World War II for something to fill the gap until the larger destroyers could be brought online. The design was an untested one based on a whaling ship. On a Corvette, three days at sea, anything that was breakable was broken. Riding in a Corvette, working, recreation time, sleeping, was extremely rough, noisy, and dirty. The sailor's life is at best a life of danger. He pursues honor on the mountain wave and finds it in the battle and in the storm. Never did more distinguished chivalry display itself than in the conduct of our seamen during the Battle of the Atlantic. At sea, I learned how little a person needs. On September 1st, 1943, on the fourth anniversary of the start of World War II, a Corvette-class warship entered the water for the first time in Kingston, Ontario. With a fresh coat of paint and bearing pennant code K368, it would go on to fight for 
and protect the Allies on the open seas of the Atlantic and across the English Channel. For a little over a year and a half before the events of late February 1945, the warship and her crew would play their part in the largest maritime force in human history. In the largest war in history. This is the story of that ship and the men who sailed on her. HMCS Trentonian of the Royal Canadian Navy. The early spring dawn broke over Trenton as Mayor H.R. Corey sat down at his desk at Trenton Town Hall. He picked up the newspaper, tucked in with the morning mail. It was early April 1943, and like most of the residents of this small eastern Ontario town, the war with Germany dominated his thoughts. It also dominated the news. He scanned the headlines and set the paper aside. There was simply too much to attend to for a thorough read this morning. He grabbed the mail and thumbing through the envelopes, he noticed one that stood out from the usual. It was from the Royal Canadian Navy. He opened it first. From the Naval Board of the Department of National Defense, it explained that the custom of navies was to name certain classes of ships after people or places, and that the Canadian Navy, following this custom, had decided to name corvettes and minesweepers after cities and towns in Canada. The letter went on to state, the HMCS Trentonian has been named after your town. The letter also explained how communities supplied comforts to the crews of their namesake vessels that the Navy didn't provide. Magazines, books, extra clothing like mittens and sweaters, or other items like radios, blankets and washing machines. It ended with a request. Would the people of Trenton, or some organization in the community, consider adopting the Corvette HMCS Trentonian. Mayor Corey looked out the window and smiled with pride. He knew the citizens of Trenton were more than ready to step up to the request. They would gladly help out the Canadian boys of the new ship Trentonian. Ignoring the rest of the mail, the mayor immediately contacted the newspaper, the Trenton Courier Advocate, to break the good news to the people of Trenton. On April 15th, newsboys fanned out across the town to deliver their charges to the townspeople. As the newspaper landed on residences and business doorsteps, the headline read, Trenton ship must have best, says Mayor. The community responded with all the heart and enthusiasm that Corey anticipated, with one woman in particular leading the charge, Miss Hazel Farley. Hazel was a teacher at Trenton High School. She had been engaged to a soldier who had died in World War I and had already been writing to every single Trenton High student or graduate who had gone to Europe. The call to action ran something deep inside of her and she immediately began organizing to heed the call. Oh, I was so proud to have a ship named after Trenton. Our community had given so much toward the effort for such a small place and many of my previous students were already in Europe, where I am certain they were making good use of their French lessons. I contacted Mayor Corey immediately. After speaking with the mayor, she spearheaded the support for the ship's crew. In just a matter of days, other members of the community jumped on board. And in May, a Trenton branch of the, the Navy League of Canada was established, followed shortly thereafter by a Navy League Cadet Corps. The ship and her crew would prove to be very well taken care of by the citizens of Trenton. Meanwhile, the ship itself was being constructed just a short distance away on Lake Ontario. In a world of clanging, banging, and the twang of steel ringing against steel, amongst the heat and shimmer of the welders, the workers of the Kingston Shipbuilding Company were hard at work on Trentonian. The hull and main structure would be completed and ready by the end of August, after a record pace of construction. When word of its imminent launch went out, a group of citizens from Trenton, including Mayor Corey and his wife, 
and Hazel Farley and members of the committee organized to supply the vessel all traveled to Kingston for the ceremony. Mayor Corey's wife was delegated to christen the ship and swung a bottle of champagne on a rope to break against the hull, but the support blocks holding the ship in dry dock were removed at the same moment and the bottle swung back to her, having completed its arc and missed entirely as the ship slid into the water. A nearby worker grabbed it off the rope and threw it with force, smashing it against the hull and saving the christening. Yes, the ship had been christened, but it wasn't yet ready for war. The second stage of construction was to begin in earnest as the ship bobbed on the water at Kingston. Some six months later, on November 11th, Trentonian's first crew members stepped aboard. Lieutenant Harrison was making his way to Kingston, Ontario with the officers of his new ship. The Canadian native of Ireland had joined the Canadian Navy Volunteer Reserve in May of 1941, after a background in the Merchant Navy, and had commanded two ships previously, the Husky and the Lunenburg, for two years of escorting convoys in eastern Canada and Great Britain. He was looking over the information regarding Trentonian and her namesake, the fact that the city of Trenton had graciously organized and had already begun sending items to Kingston for the crew, organized by one Hazel Farley. Harrison knew well the dedication to the national cause that Trenton was so familiar with and a part of. The city had hosted the nation's largest flying training center at RCAF Trenton since 1931. However, the city had known its fair share of wartime danger as well. The explosion at the British Chemical Munitions Plant on Thanksgiving Day in 1918 had rained havoc across most of the city, pulverizing windows, throwing detritus thousands of feet, and causing mass evacuations. As he came ever closer to Kingston, Harrison thought that in light of the dedication and courage of real Trentonians, the ship bore the perfect namesake. Harrison and his officers arrived in Kingston at the shipyard and immediately approached the hull of the ship. It was ready for the water, and members of the community of Trenton would soon be on hand for the official launch. The first of the ratings would be arriving soon, and he was eager to meet his officers. Lieutenant William Burley Kingsman, second in command, was a native of Vancouver. He greeted Harrison with a strong, firm handshake. Lieutenant L.P. Parr, navigation officer, was quiet but keen. Two sub-lieutenants, C.H. LaRose and D.J. Dodds, were Trentonian's gunnery officer and submarine officer, respectively. The senior officers and I boarded the ship just ahead of the first crew. We were given a brief tour and shown to our quarters. Of course, at the time, the ship still needed a lot of work. But some of the gifts from the people of Trenton had already arrived, and I determined that I would make a visit to that city before we departed Kingston. It was about this time that the first ratings arrived aboard the vessel to assist in the first round of testing. And one of the first to set foot on the deck was a young man named Alan Singleton. Alan Singleton was from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and came aboard Trentonian as the sick bay attendant, or Tiffy, in Navy slang. He was young, but eager. He was also an avid amateur photographer, and boarded with his box camera tucked under one arm. I was surprised when the lieutenant clapped me on the shoulder, but then he measured my camera and I understood. Now, I am no way a professional photographer, and I told him it was more of a hobby. But I was also glad to have that personal interaction, and that he didn't care I had brought it along. The other executive officers had lined the rail of Trentonian to greet the first ratings as they climbed the gangway. They each shook his hand in turn as the other crew members filed on behind him. The first few seamen were needed to conduct the open water tests on the new ship. Over the next few weeks, the tests were conducted. These were interesting at first, but quickly became tedious. During those first weeks on board Trentonian, Alan Singleton remembered days on end of what seemed like the same thing happening over and over. Speed tests, turns to check the rudder, running the engine in various conditions. It was boring after a while. The sick bay wasn't really needed yet. There were a few small scrapes, but nothing serious. I spent a lot of time during those early days assisting when I could, 
but it was mostly waiting. On December 1st, another contingent from Trenton came for the raising of the White Ensign and the launch of the now seaworthy vessel and for the first time step on board. Alan Singleton spent the day moving among the flesh and blood Trentonians as they explored and marveled at their steel namesake. He regularly brought out his camera and asked for poses. The feeling in the air was one of accomplishment, pride and wonder. The ratings that had lived aboard for a month or more had already made it feel like home, but the supplies and gifts the people of the small city brought with them added the personal touch of a community's worth of support. The gifts were placed in the ship with care, the mittens and the coats and clothing handed out to men by size and fit. A gramophone was placed in the mess, and even a piano made its way aboard after being taken apart to fit through the doorway. Other provisions and supplies were loaded over the next two days, and the Trentonian left the docks of the Kingston Shipbuilding Company for the last time on December 3rd. As the ship launched, fully operational for the first time, but still missing some armaments and the ASDIC system which would be installed in Quebec and Nova Scotia, Singleton swelled with pride despite the cold. He swiveled his camera around to capture the view of Kingston as the Trentonian angled out into Lake Ontario. After taking a few moments to feel the breeze against his face and peer off into a future he couldn't begin to anticipate, he turned from the deck to head down to his sick bay. Joe Taft, one of the ship's cooks, called down after him. I remember seeing Singleton on that deck as we left Kingston. Of course, I'd seen a camera before, but I didn't expect to see one on the deck of a warship. He was an odd sight, a little guy pressing his face against that thing, turning it this way and that. When he packed up, I remember hollering at him. Too bad we don't have a dark room, eh, pal? Little did I know it gave him an idea. The trip up the St. Lawrence was rather uneventful. A three-day stop in Montreal saw more crew board the vessel. Singleton watched from the foredeck as the fresh faces boarded the Trentonian. One of these was a stoker from Carbon, Alberta, named Sidney Coates, and he looked relieved if a little weary. Singleton saw the same man that afternoon in the mess hall and approached him. Oh boy, was I tired that first day. It's no wonder Singleton mentioned it in the mess hall. He said something like, you're looking a mite better than you did coming aboard this morning. Well, I told him these accommodations were a lot better than what I had been used to. Coates told me he had been on two ships previously and had been awaiting reassignment for weeks in Montreal arriving every day to attend morning parade to see if his name was called to a ship. One morning, he missed the call, because he had come out of the city the night before with a friend. We overslept. We woke up and realized our mistake and rushed as fast as we could back to roll call. They missed the division call. Coates was considered AWOL and he was placed in a cell for seven days. After a grueling imprisonment consisting of a poor rations and a demanding training routine, he was released and assigned to the Trentonian. So you can see, I was on a very terrible vacation, and I was looking forward to duty. It wasn't hard to make friends during such times, and the crew continued to get a feel for each other as the ship made its way east. A few days later, the ship arrived at Quebec City. The crew noticed the temperature drop inside the ship, even though new insulation had just been installed. At this time, another group of men joined the crew, there were now 88 men aboard Trentonian. Soon, every mess hall and many of the quarters had become an icebox. Every meal or moment spent in the mess was accompanied by a lot of hand rubbing, cursing, and visible exhalations of breath. Men were sleeping in layers of clothes just to find some comfort. Then one morning at breakfast, someone noticed icicles hanging off the deckheads. That's it, the guy hollered. Either they heat this tub up or I leave the ship. A few men rose to go with them, and off they went to find the coxswain. After much complaining and other threats of desertion, Harrison called for the engineers on shore to look into it. An investigation was done, and it was discovered that the blowers for the heaters in the ventilation had been installed backwards. Instead of blowing stale air out, it was sucking cold air from outside in. After this repair, the ship became much more comfortable, and the crew played cards, wrote letters home, and otherwise enjoyed their first warm night in some days. Later in the voyage, 
When men complained it was too cool, Singleton and some of the first crewmen would recount those first two weeks in the icebox of their mess. They also received more gifts from the city of Trenton. Lieutenant Harrison spent some part of the afternoon writing a letter to Miss Farley of the Trenton Corvette Committee to thank her for the supplies. He also thanked her for starting a pen pal program with the local students. Meanwhile, the recently delivered Afghan coats were distributed amongst the crew. I was in the middle of reading a letter from a high schooler in Trenton when a weight fell on me and I was in sudden darkness with a whiff of cinnamon. Hey, what is this? I yelled down the hall. It's your very own Afghan from the citizens of Trenton, one of the crew called back to me as they carried on. I tried to find the scent of winter baking on the blanket, but it was lost. It gave me a brief glimpse of my grandmother and my first real twinge of homesickness. Home had always smelled of baking during the month of December. Although the ship was ready to go, orders had been delayed due to the weather. Then they were delayed again as the storm continued. On Christmas Eve, Singleton was in the mess having lunch when Stoker Sidney Coates came rushing in. All the men looked up from their food as he smiled broadly and explained his excitement. Oh, I remember how excited I was. Orders had been delayed again, and I was going to see about going ashore Christmas morning. A few of the guys laughed, though. Why on earth would they let you go ashore, Coates? They all laughed this time, but I did it. The next day, a few men were given leave, and I was one of them. <laughs> Off he had gone down the gangway, his smile beaming all the while. When he returned that evening, Singleton saw him making his way toward the bunks. I saw him that evening coming aboard and asked how his day had been. A Merry Christmas indeed, he said, and told me he had met a couple of nice young ladies and they had a bit of a skate. He clapped me on the shoulder and continued down the hall. I wonder if that smile left his face all day. That evening, the men had their Christmas dinner. As is the custom in the Navy on Christmas Day, the youngest member of the crew traded places with the skipper, and his first order of duty was to stand down from normal routine for dinner. Joe Taft and the other cooks prepared a turkey dinner with all the trimmings. The next morning, orders were received and the ship was to depart Quebec City with the corvette Norsid and the tug Norton en route to Halifax. The crew got to work readying the ship for departure. A harbour pilot was brought on board, somewhat intimately familiar with the hazards and the currents around Quebec City, and the ship made its way into the St. Lawrence. Singleton was in the sick bay, stocking more supplies brought aboard at the last minute, when he was startled out of his work by a thud that shook the ship. Then another, and another. Grabbing his coat, he made his way to the foredeck. Before he had even opened the door at the top of the stairs, he could hear Harrison yelling, Either the pilot sees his smacking into ice flows immediately, or I will throw him overboard. The cause of Lieutenant Harrison's anger wasn't clear, so I approached one of the crew on duty. He said the pilot has been ramming the ice. He's gone and popped a few rivets, and Harrison won't have it. Well, I was pleased to hear our commanding officer wasn't afraid to assert his authority for the protection of the vessel, even if it was only a harbor pilot. I went back to the sick bay where I had a project in mind and started eyeing up the bulkheads of the room. It was three days' travel to Halifax down the St. Lawrence, the first time the ship had been out of harbour for many of the men. The more immediate problem proved to be seasickness, and the worst affected were two of the cooks, one of whom was practically incapacitated by the condition. With a full complement of 110 men and officers, Trentonian was almost ready for war. On New Year's Eve, the excitement could be felt shipwide, and most of the crew were granted leave. They polished their shoes and wore their best uniforms. The men made their way to the Salvation Army canteen, and all agreed it was a wonderful night, although Sidney Coates was overheard complaining as they left to return to the ship. Good food, good company, but no drinks? What kind of New Year's is it without a drink or two? Over the next month, Trentonian was fitted with more electronics, guns, a large searchlight and other equipment. The rivets popped by the harbour pilot were repaired, pom-pom and Orlikon machine guns were mounted and tested. On January 30th, as Harrison was completing a letter to Hazel Farley updating the city of Trenton on their namesake, 
Orders came down from the senior naval officer in Liverpool. Slip at 1200 tomorrow, Monday, and being in all respects ready for sea, proceed at 12 knots directly to Halifax. Trentonian was complete and ready for service. Now it was time to get the men similarly prepared. 17 days of training commenced for the crew on arrival in Halifax on January 31st. The time was spent on getting the crew familiar with, with the electronics and stations of the ship. They learned how to work together as a team. Each man was assigned a station with a specific location on board and corresponding responsibilities, both during normal operation and when engaging the enemy. All aspects of their individual jobs were practiced and drilled until every crew member knew their responsibilities and equipment intimately. On February 16th, Trentonian received orders to conduct hedgehog weapons testing. These were naval mortars, anti-submarine weapons, launched from the deck to approximately 230 meters in front of the ship. This was the range where ASDIC, or sonar detection of submarines, became problematic due to the close proximity. Trentonian also received her first orders later that day. The ship was to sail to Bermuda on the 18th. The deck was beginning to ice over completely at this point. There were men playing shinny on the foredeck, and someone runs out and says, We're being posted to Bermuda? It was almost unbelievable. Trentonian set sail, fully fueled and fully armed in the company of Kitchener, a recently refitted corvette that would complete its own training in Bermuda. As the ships left the harbor and made their way into the open ocean, the spray from the water quickly congealed on everything they splashed down upon. It wasn't long before ice had gripped the corvette from stem to stern. It clung to every piece of exposed material like a great white coat. Inches thick, it weighed down wires and lines and entombed the railings. It had frozen equipment and armaments exactly as they lay. A ship covered in ice can become dangerously top-heavy lose stability and become difficult to maneuver. The crew on duty were turned out onto the deck with hammers and hatchets, picks and shovels to clear the ship of its coat of ice. Alan Singleton climbed up from below deck with his camera. It was an amazing sight. No one would ever believe a ship could hold so much ice and still remain afloat. As he snapped his first few photos of the glacial vessel, he heard a voice on the foredeck shouting orders. It was Chief Petty Officer Thomas Raymond Roberts. The ice was becoming a serious problem. Not only was it covering everything, it was slowing the vessel down and there was possible concern it would damage the ship. I had to raise my voice above the wind. We need to hack every railing and chip away all this bloody ice. I urged them to be careful with the wiring of the pipes. We didn't need to run. The muted sound of thuds and thwacks filled the air, followed by the jangle of clattering ice. After taking a couple of photos, Singleton retreated back below deck. He was thankful he wasn't on duty for the ice clearing job. The crew woke the next morning to find the temperature had increased substantially overnight. The ship had steered their way south and were leaving the frigid temperatures behind. However, the relief from the icy grip of the northern waters was quickly replaced with a threat from the south, a hurricane. Dark skies preceded a sharp increase in wave height. Orders were issued that no one should be on deck. Soon, towering walls of water 80 to 90 feet high tossed the corvette like a child's toy. The men remained in their messes and bunks as seasickness spread faster than the wind that whirled about them. Only a few men were even capable of maintaining the ship during the storm. They lost contact with Kitchener. Waves of water poured over the ship and found every possible hole or vent to pour into. Seawater swirled down the hallways, every nook and cranny. No one was safe from being sprayed or battered by the violence of the ocean. Everything was soaked as Stoker coats came off duty. I had just come from the boiler room, stepped into the stoker's mess and put my foot down into two feet of water. I couldn't believe my eyes, or that one of my mates had managed to sleep during the flood despite the tossing of the ship. When I tried to drain the water into the locker where the anchor chain is stored, I discovered it was flooded too. 
and it sure didn't smell good. The mess was literally that. I could barely stand. When I tried to prep dinner, I lost what little lunch I had left. I've made plenty of meals in plenty of rough seas before. No trouble, but never anything like this. <clears throat> Thank goodness a couple men were capable and threw something together for those who could eat. The storm cleared to find Trentonian completely lost. The cloud cover provided no way of affixing a position by star or sun, and their partnership, Kitchener, was nowhere to be seen in any direction. Navigation officer L.P. Parr could not fulfill his duty. I was at a total loss to determine our position. Of course, the ship's compass showed which direction we were heading, but were we still north of Bermuda? How far had we been pushed off course? It was completely impossible to say. Luckily, help was soon gained from HMS Lawson, a Royal Navy frigate, and it was discovered Trentonium was 100 miles east of Bermuda. The course was corrected, and they arrived in the harbor on February 21st. The Kitchener arrived the next day. Trentonian had suffered at the hands of the Tempest. The hull had been battered and the deck had sustained damage from the violent force of the waves. The next two days consisted of getting the ship's damage repaired. Signalman Jack McIver of Winnipeg was tasked with scrubbing the communication deck. It was a terrible job. There was seawater and spilled food everywhere, but worst of all was a vomit, some of which was mine. I scrubbed the whole place with caustic soda to the point where the towel fell completely apart. The tiles on the floor, well, they were dissolved by the cleaner. They ended up having to replace the whole floor. I threw out the gloves when I was done. They surprisingly, they, they had held up. Training commenced immediately after the stand-down order was lifted. Numerous drills for firefighting, boarding, maneuvering, damage control, gunnery drills, Man overboard, even mock battles were conducted in the warm waters of Bermuda. The men fired at test targets. Anti-aircraft guns were practiced with. Even a training submarine was used to bolster the skills of the ASDIC operators. There was downtime as well, which included chore leave. Bermuda was great. Besides keeping busy with all the training, we got to shore a couple of times as well. About five bottles of rum down there for 75 cents each and made a killing selling them back in Halifax. <laughs> and someone tried to bring a monkey on board the ship. They said no ship in the RCN had a monkey as a mascot. But Lieutenant Kingsman spotted it and had the monkey sent back ashore. Oh, and Frank Barron had the good fortune to meet his brother-in-law who was stationed on another ship. Oh, it was a joy to see him, that was for sure. But he told me that one of his crew had his toes bitten off by a barracuda during evacuation drills. So when the Trentonian stayed the same drill not long after, I refused to do it at first. But I was forced to conduct the drill alongside the rest of the crew. Still, I managed to stay on the ladder, because uh, no way I was going to leave in my toes in the Bermuda. Day of the evacuation stations, we were missing a man in Section 3. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but he went into the drink with the rest of them. Orders were received to return to Halifax, and on February 29th, the crew watched as Bermuda shrank on the horizon behind them, while Trentonian steamed north. Slowly, temperatures dropped, and ice began to form on every exposed piece of metal on deck. Trentonian arrived back in Halifax on March 3rd. Harrison ran them through scenario after scenario, calling them to stations repeatedly. On March 11th, Trentonian received orders and returned to Halifax alongside Corvettes Bucktouche, Drumheller, and Kitchener, with Harrison designated the senior officer. They arrived in Halifax shortly after midnight on the 12th. A full-caliber shoot of the guns was scheduled, and this was completed on the 14th. For a lot of us, the firing exercise was the first real sense we had our own firepower. Sure, they had fired the guns before, but not all at once and not with the same sense of intent. There could be no mistaking it now. We were aboard a warship. Trentonian was now officially operational. They were assigned to the Western Local Escort Force, Group W10, 
and left Halifax on March 15th in the company of the river-class frigate New Glasgow and Corvettes Louisburg II and Drumheller, the commander of the latter being the senior officer. Later that day, they met up with 62 merchant ships, which had departed New York on March 13th en route to Liverpool, UK, escorted by the minesweeper Winnipeg and Corvettes Timmins, Trail and Cobalt. Together, these ships were convoy HX-283. I was off duty when we joined up with the merchant ships and the other warships coming up from New York. And I took the opportunity to stand on deck. It had been quite a while since I'd been posted into a convoy. And it really is quite the sight to see so many ships traveling together so tightly. I was in the sick bay that afternoon. I had just strung up some wires across the bulkheads at the back of the room. The first pieces of a makeshift darkroom. It wouldn't get in the way of the medical equipment or supplies, and I was excited to get some of my photographs developed. Anyway, one of the boys came in to tell me we were approaching the convoy, and I had to get my camera and come on deck. A few had come up to watch as well, and I noticed Singleton was standing 50 paces away with his camera, only he wasn't even looking through the box. He just gaped. For the first couple of minutes, I just stared. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This giant mass of metal and men turning towards us. I mean, I'd seen wide open spaces and our first day in open ocean had reminded me of home. Kinda. This was awe-inspiring. Little did I know then what sights I would see from that deck. The convoy made their way toward Liverpool with Trentonian at a station, zigzagging along in front of the convoy, providing a defensive shield to the merchant ships while also constantly scanning the depths below for German subs with their ASDIC system. For three days they travelled this way, until orders were received from Halifax. To detach from the convoy, to search out a possible submarine contact. On March 18th, numerous ships, including Trentonian, made their way to the area where a sonar boy had picked up the contact, approximately 150 nautical miles south of Halifax. New Glasgow and Trentonian were the first vessels on the scene approximately 15 hours after the last contact with the submarine. You now us ASDEC operators had a lot of training on the system, with dummy subs and everything, and we all felt confident that we'd find that U-boat. But every time my shift ended and I peeled off the headphones, I secretly hoped it would stay hidden a while longer. I wanted to be the first one to report a real U-boat contact. By the 20th, no new contact had been made, and to the dismay of at least one ASDEC operator, Trentonian was ordered back to Halifax. While at port, Harrison received a letter forwarded by the Navy Board from the city of Trenton, acknowledging receipt of the adoption papers and listing all the supplies so far sent by the citizenry. Musical instruments, clothes, games, puzzles, and the personal hygiene supplies were all provided by the proud citizens of Trenton. The Navy Board had replied with a letter thanking the city for providing such a wealth of material to the crew and contained a list of supplies still needed, including a washing machine. As most of the crew washed their clothing with a washboard and bucket, a washing machine would be a real boon to the ship. And so, of course, back in Trenton, Hazel Farley was on the case. I've hand-washed my fair share of laundry, and I can speak directly to how much physical effort goes into it. If those young men were anything like the ones I've known, they have plenty of courage, honor, and ability. But getting a bad grease stain out isn't a priority. I knew we in the community could step in. While Miss Farley began organizing the purchase of a washing machine for the Trentonian, some of the stokers had come up with their own solution to the problem. I think it started out as a joke about throwing all our stinky clothes overboard, but it turned into an idea and wasn't long before we had a rig set up made of an old milk can with holes drilled all through it. We put a latch on the top, tied a long line to her, and stuffed it full of dirty clothes. We'd throw it overboard while the ship was underway, and an hour later, poof! Clean clothes. You just had to beat the salt out of it once they dried. However, for those who are still doing laundry the old-fashioned way, a machine would make a real difference. Trentonian received orders to escort a convoy from Halifax to Liverpool, 
it would be the first of many such excursions, meeting merchant vessels, escorting them to a mid-sea rendezvous with the next convoy, turning back to Halifax, rolling across the water at low speed because the merchant ships were so lollygagging slow, keeping eyes on the water and the sky while cutting the familiar back-and-forth zigzag at the head of the convoy, the men working the Aztec system, sweeping the water for enemy contacts, ears tuned in and warmed by the headphones that gave them tabs on the sounds undersea. The stokers, like coats down below in the belly of Trentonian, keeping the oil flowing to the engines and the mechanical elements in working order. Radio operators always at the ready. The Aztec operators had been well trained to identify contacts on their equipment and frequently, as the ship passed over the Grand Banks, operators such as Gordon Gibbons would make regular reports of anything on the screen. One afternoon, Harrison was on the bridge when he noticed a contact on screen. He called the Asdick hut to identify, and the operator replied, it was a biological contact already reported to the officer of the watch. Harrison ordered the ship turned around and brought directly above the contact. Then he ordered a single depth charge dropped as the ship moved over the signal. The crew wondered what this was about. Simply more training. Harrison once again ordered the ship brought back to the location of the contact. I had no idea what was happening. I had been in the sick bay attending to a few minor abrasions when we felt the ship initiate a sharp turn. And the guy I'm tending to looks up at me, concerned. Action stations were called, the klaxon rang, and the sailor I was with dashed out of the room. Us officers knew what Harrison was about. I mean, some of the older ones did too. I couldn't help but smile when I saw some of them manning their stations all ready for battle. Others were just sharpening their knives. I ordered the whaler lowered and sent some of the men out for the spoils. By the time I had heard it wasn't a submarine, the whaler was already on the water. I stood at the rail and couldn't believe what I was seeing. The men were hauling loads of fish. I ran back for my camera and took a few shots of the men posing with the catch. That night, Taft and the cooks fried them all up in some milk, and we had a feast. By April 17th, Trentonian was back in Halifax. The crew was tasked with repainting the ship. While this occurred, a new radar unit was installed, and four more Oilican guns were added to defend against air attack. This started rumours among the crew as there was very little risk of an air assault on the vessel on this side of the Atlantic. Then, on April 18th, the, the crew received new paychecks for overseas duties. Harrison took the opportunity of time to write a letter to Miss Hazel Farley. He thanked her for her efforts in securing the washing machine and expressed his hope that it would arrive soon. The people of Trenton were kept up to date about the ship, and Hazel kept every letter that Harrison sent her. Harrison had also sent two photographs of the crew to be shown to the students of Trenton High School, who were so diligent in writing. One of the photos is still on display at the Quinty West City Hall and Public Library. The morning of April 23rd broke over Halifax and glinted on the fresh paint job and newly refurbished hull of Trentonian. All stores and supplies had been replenished and loaded, guns had been tested, and half the crew had even had shore leave. Everything was prepared and ready for sea when Lieutenant Harrison called the crew together. Orders had come in that morning, and I felt it necessary to address the crew regarding our new role. I told them the news. We are going to England. Take a good look, boys. This will be the last time we see Canada for quite some time. It was a weird feeling. Here we are at war, but not at war. I mean, don't get me wrong. There was always a U-boat threat, and certainly some ships were attacked and sank on the home side while we were running our escorts. But England? Well, that's going to war. Those anti-aircraft guns took on a dread new significance. Trentonian arrived in London Derry Island on May 1st, 1944. 
accompanied by Louis Berg II and Lindsay, when news arrived of the sinking of Valleyfield off the coast of Newfoundland. Only 38 men survived, while 123 crew members and two passengers were killed. When Stoker Sidney Coates heard the news, he paled. It struck me pretty hard. Valleyfield was the ship I had been assigned to and missed the call for back in Quebec City. If I hadn't missed that call, I mean... Those seven days in the brig feel a bit different now. It was during their days in London, Derry, when Trentonian received an additional, albeit tiny, crew member. A small dog made its way onto the deck and voluntarily stayed. The crew loved the furry little terrier, and it certainly appeared as if the terrier loved them. After some discussion and the setting of ground rules, the dog was allowed to stay, and the crew gave him a rank and designation. Abel Seaman O'Brien was their first and only canine recruit. Signalman Jack Harold was assigned his primary caregiver, and they even slung a small hammock close to the ground in the communications mess, where he could sleep. After the 11-day crossing and an additional 20 days of battle training, the crew was granted leave. This included anti-submarine officer Lieutenant Dodds and the navigator Lieutenant Parr. As they waited on dock for a cab, Parr grabbed Dodd's cap and tucked it under his arm as if it were a football, and sprinted off down the jetty as if making for a touchdown. Dodds ran after him, caught up, and tackled Parr to the ground. A horrendous sound that Jack Harold described as a crack heard around the fleet was followed by the screams of Parr. As the men on board gathered at the railing, an ambulance was called to tend to Parr terrible news his femur had been broken in the tackle. Dodds was ordered to the captain's berth. Not long after, the crew could hear the verbal lashing that Dodds was getting from Harrison, which included the line, This childish act has now endangered the ship and men. A temporary navigation officer was assigned and reported to Trentonian the next day, Lieutenant John Macbeth. Harrison and the new officer spent most of the day in Harrison's cabin going over plans that would soon be underway. On May 23rd, Trentonian left for Oban, Scotland. They would arrive to a harbour filled with ships. Lieutenant Harrison was assigned senior officer to an escort group, which included Mayflower, Drumhella, Rimouski and Lindsay. And on May 31st, the escort ships left the harbour first, sweeping the ocean with their Aztec systems, always on the hunt for U-boats. 60 ships most of them old rust buckets, some of which had fought in World War I, made up the convoy making its way slowly into the Irish Sea, which was filled with traffic. Other convoys passed them going in the opposite direction. Bombers and other aircraft were seen flying overhead. Unlike the other side of the Atlantic, there was much commotion here. The convoy made way into the English Channel and was passed by an American and a British battle fleet. They continued along, moving at five knots so the old merchant vessels wouldn't be left behind. On June 4th, signalman Jack Harold relayed a message to Harrison. Exercise delayed 24 hours. Anchor in Pool Bay. The convoy altered course. On June 5th, 1944, Lieutenant Harrison informed the crew the invasion of Europe was 24 hours away. Operation Overlord was about to commence and Trentonian, along with her convoy, was going to the beachhead at Normandy to participate in Operation Neptune, the naval division of the assault. I couldn't believe it. Here we were, thousands of miles from Canada, about to participate in the largest naval operation in history as part of the largest land invasion in history, and I have to admit, I was anxious. I was a strange blend of nervous and excited. I grabbed my camera and headed on deck and remembered looking around my makeshift darkroom. And my first thought was, I need more wires. And my second thought was, I really hope I'll need them. And that got me thinking about my preparedness as a medic. The equipment, I didn't want to need any of that. As Trentonian, Drumheller, Rimouski, Lindsay, and Nasturtium entered Pool Bay with their convoy and bombers flew endlessly overhead, the immensity of the invasion force became clear. 
The warships anchored here represented almost every type of ship in commission. Battleships, cruisers, destroyers, corvettes like Trentonian, minesweepers and troop ships bobbed on the ocean waves. As night fell over the warships and older merchant vessels in Pool Bay, an orange glow could be seen in the sky on the far side of the channel. The bombers had begun their part in the assault. Harrison ordered the men to action stations. Shifts were four hours on, four hours off. This allowed for everyone to get enough rest, even if sleep was difficult in such short breaks. The morning of June 6, 1944 broke to bright flashes on the eastern horizon and the constant roar of airplanes flying overhead toward the French mainland. I was on deck that morning having just come off duty. I had to get a sense of what was happening out there. The sky was dark with aircraft. Bombers, fighters, cargo planes, all heading towards France. There were now also planes coming back from the battle, some smoking and some of their engines sounding pretty rough. We had received notice that the land invasion had begun and tens of thousands of troops were in France moving inland. I looked towards the flashes and lights to the east and wondered, how on earth could anyone be alive under all of that? Harrison ordered the lower decks of the ship evacuated and sealed to minimize risk to the crew in the case of an attack. This crowded the upper level messes and made their cramped life even more uncomfortable. But every man understood the necessity. That afternoon, Harrison gathered the men on deck immediately before their departure from Pool Bay. I had heard some of the rumors being spread by the men. They had little news of the invasion itself, aside from what they could pick up on the BBC through the radios. Anxiety was high and they needed to understand that things in France were going well. I explained that air and naval bombardment of shore positions had been effective. It became clear now why we were escorting around these old rusty tubs. They were going to be sunk to provide defense positions and impede movement of German vessels. I couldn't believe that we were heading directly towards the largest assault to ever take place. I hope you didn't meet any U-boats or German warships on the way. Although, looking at the firepower around and overhead, I felt safe on board the Trentonian, whether that was reasonable or not. Operation Overlord had actually begun when Trentonian's convoy left Oba. It was the first movement of naval vessels in what was a highly complex order of operations to commence the assault. It also became clear to the men why Harrison had been so enraged at Lieutenant Parr's injury. Parr had spent weeks studying the invasion, plans, maps, memorizing the routes and where the barrier ships in the convoy were to be sunk. These locations were codenamed Gooseberry. His replacement, Lieutenant Macbeth, had only days to do the same. The convoy arrived at Area Z, the staging ground on the English side of the channel for any vessel entering the active assault zone. Minesweepers had cleared seven wide channels approaching the beach, and navigational buoys had been installed that afternoon. The warships were to separate and escort the soon-to-be-sunk merchant vessels towards shore down the specific channels. Trentonian and her convoy reached the minesweeper cleared channels of the assault area at 0540 on June 7th. The escorted vessels were divided and each section was sent toward the American Gooseberries. The remaining ships were assigned to Gooseberry 4 off Juno Beach and number 5 off British Beach. By 11.55 that morning Trentonian had successfully escorted three groups of ships to their necessary position along the beach and had escorted a tug back alongside the Manchester Spinner, a freighter piloted by the Commodore of this division. They dropped anchor just off Juno Beach. We were stationed alongside HMS Roberts, a monitor ship that was providing artillery support to the troops inland. It only had one turret with two 15-inch monsters mounted on it. And let me tell you, Whenever it fired well, it sounded like the world ending. 
The deck rattled under your feet. I could feel the pressure on my chest. Those shells must have hit like the hand of God strike in the ground. At 1350, Trentonian was on the move again, escorting tugs to Gooseberry 3, where the ships were placed in a row to be scuttled. This was accomplished with great difficulty due to the roughness of the sea. Explosive charges had been laid throughout the ships, and the skeleton crews that manoeuvred the vessels into position were evacuated. As the first vessel's charges were triggered, explosions ripped through the air and the ship immediately began to sink. At 1600, Trentonian left the area on orders to return to Area Z across the channel to receive the next load of Gooseberry-bound ships. They delivered these back to the French coast, arriving in the morning of June 8th. New orders were received that afternoon, and at 12.35, Trentonian churned back across the channel, leaving the Normandy coast for Portsmouth, along with Louisbourg II. It had been two days since D-Day, and although there was still ample traffic on the water, there were also casualties. HMS Lawford, a Royal Navy frigate, had been converted to a headquarters for the invasion and had been bombed that morning. Its stem and stern stuck up out of the water like a child's toy that had been smashed in the middle. Somewhere under the dark waters, its smashed middle lay on the bottom. 37 men had died in the attack. As we left the coast, a few of us stood on deck. Singleton was there with his camera, taking photos the whole time. And I got him to snap a couple just for me. By that time, he had begun taking orders for photographs and developing them in the sick bay. He had a real business going back there. Anyway, just as I was wondering how the troops were doing inland, I caught a glimpse of something up ahead floating in the water. As it got closer, I realized it was the body of a soldier bobbing along in his life jacket an American flag on his shoulder. He bumped up alongside the ship, just kind of sliding down the side of us. And there was a, a bird picking at the flesh of his face. I'll never forget that for as long as I live. Trentonian crossed the channel without incident and anchored off Portsmouth Harbour at 1925 on the evening of June 8th, 1944. The crew were given a rest, but no leave. At 2100, on the evening of June 11th, the crew was called to stations, and the ship lifted anchor and left Portsmouth. At 02.15 the next morning, they made a rendezvous with two British cable ships already under the escort of HMS Dianthus and an anti-submarine trawler, the HMS Hugh Walpole, off the needles of the Isle of Wight. The monotony of the mission, which consisted of circling the slowest vessels at close range, was broken by the sight of planes in the sky and a falling bomb. The planes were German Fokker Wolf FW190 aircraft, but they were quickly chased from the area when 12 Spitfires came roaring across the sky. As darkness fell and the two ships made their way at a snail's place, laying cable on the bottom, tracer fire and explosions could be seen on the horizon. There was traffic all about them as ships passed back and forth across the channel. As they approached the coast of France, the possibility of a shore battery assault also loomed. Tensions were high. Unknown to the crew of Monarch and Trentonian, two American destroyers were patrolling not far from their location. The Americans had picked up the two ships on their radar and assumed they were friendly contacts. The commanding officer, W. Alterson, piloting the USS Plunkett, ordered star shells to be fired over the contacts at 0230, but the shell failed to work properly due to such close range. As the distance continued dwindling between the two groups, Plunkett made another attempt to contact the vessels, flashing a message across the darkness. Plunkett repeated their signal three times, ten seconds apart, no response was received, Plunkett opened fire at 3,000 yards. Trentonian was on the port side of Monarch. Firing commenced on a bearing of 160 degrees. No gun flashes were seen. Shells were heard close by, passing between the ships and over Trentonian. 
I immediately ordered the men to stations. Arm the guns, but do not fire! I realized quickly this was friendly fire from the American destroyers. Thank God their initial barrage missed us. One shell passed directly between the funnel and the pom-pom gun platform. Recognition lights were ordered to be flashed on and off, at which point fire then seemed to be redirected to Monarch. These shells didn't miss, and the sound was deafening as the ship was hammered by the American vessel. Harrison ordered Trentonian turned to broadside to present a silhouette of the ship that the Americans might recognize. Fire once again turned to Trentonian, and once again the shells missed her completely. The range was now only 1,000 yards. Harrison was livid. He couldn't believe what was happening. He gave orders to maintain a broadside position and then came down and stormed the deck. He leaned over the railing and I cannot forget the sight of the lieutenant shaking his fist and yelling out, Damn poor guttery for such a close range! The signalman was sending a message in Morse code to the American vessel and radio operators were frantically trying to communicate with a destroyer while all the lights of Trentonian were ordered turned on and left on. As soon as the lights were observed by Plunkett, the barrage stopped. It is estimated that Plunkett fired approximately 80 rounds of 5-inch ammunition at the two vessels, with Monarch taking the brunt of the attack. Rescue attempts commenced immediately with Monarch's whaler coming alongside with wounded, where it eventually sunk from its own damage. Meanwhile, Trentonian's whaler was dispatched to pick up remaining injured and return them to Trentonian. A number of crew on deck had been killed by the attack, as well as the first mate. At 0335, the American destroyer sent a boat to Trentonian. While the crew were refused entry, a young ensign had asked to speak to Lieutenant Harrison and was brought aboard. Harrison didn't even speak. He just stood there boiling in rage and let Lieutenant Kingsman ask the questions. This young officer in Plunkett told us his commander thought we were a German e-boat. An e-boat. Trentonian is twice the size of an e-boat and the cable layer is even bigger. Harrison made no motion. He just stood there with silent rage. When the insult left, he finally let loose, calling the Americans trigger happy, asking for a court martial. I've never seen him like that before. Never would again. The casualties were numerous. One man was sent to Plunkett for more serious care. Some of our crew were commissioned to help me out in the sick bay. There were just too many people to take care of. The doctor was also sent to the Monarch from the American group. It didn't take long for the crew to realize the Americans were responsible for the assault, and some had to be physically restrained from boarding the Plunkett's whaler to teach them a lesson. Meanwhile, the damage to Monarch was extensive. The ship had to be steered manually as the bridge had been almost completely swept away by the assault. By 0724, Plunkett's doctor had treated 10 men who were now aboard Trentonian. One of these was Captain Troops of the Monarch, who had suffered a severe head injury, was unconscious, and not expected to survive. Some of the crew of Trentonian hadn't realized they were under attack. Some men off duty had even slept through the barrage. They had gotten quite used to the sound of heavy armaments firing. By 2200, all the wounded had been removed from the ship, and Trentonian anchored in a remote section of Portsmouth Harbor. Several dignitaries came on board and informed the remaining crew that not a word of the incident should ever be discussed with anyone. It was to remain completely secret. The crew was once again confined to the ship while resupplies were brought aboard. A new member also joined the crew, Sergeant Lieutenant G.P. West, Royal Navy Reserve, would be Trentonian's very own doctor. I must say, I was very relieved when Wes came aboard. I had training in running the sick bay, of course, but I was no doctor. Many of the injuries sustained in the Plunkett attack had been beyond my help, and the American doctors were more than capable. Having West aboard would ensure that if another serious incident occurred, we could handle our own casualties. On June 15th, orders were received to meet a convoy at Selsey. 
but first they tied up alongside the tanker ship SS Teakwood for refueling. The crew passed a six-inch hose across the gap, which carried the fuel into the corvette. It was a thick fluid, so it was heated to help it flow between the vessels. Only a handful of crew was on deck, including the little dog A.B. O'Brien in his usual place on the bridge. While the fuel was being transferred to Trentonian, a pair of American destroyers came churning into the area at speed. A wake rolled across the water and began to toss Trentonian around. The fuel tanker was far too big and heavy to be affected. As the waves rocked the corvette, the fuel line burst, and a plume of hot bunker fuel sprayed across the deck of Trentonian, covering the Asdic hut and upper works as far back as the funnel. The men tried to make for cover, but were completely soaked in the heavy oil. Not even little A.B. O'Brien escaped the oily spray, and needed multiple washings. Signalman Jack Harold said that the remnants of the fluid were on his skin for days. While the deck and rails and ladders were hurriedly cleaned, the crew, who hadn't failed to notice what flags the destroyers were flying, once again cursed the Americans. We had made across the Atlantic, made countless crossings of the Channel, been part of Operation Overlord, the D-Day invasion, and escorted hundreds of ships in the process. And during that whole time, the only threat we ever faced, the only trouble we really had, was the Americans. Boy, we were ticked off. Trentonian arrived at Selsey by 2047, and by 2210 the convoy was formed and began steaming for France. It consisted of large concrete blocks of various sizes, code named Phoenixes, being towed by tugs. The idea was to sink these blocks to begin the construction of artificial harbours off the invasion area, which would allow for faster resupply and transport of munitions and goods to the battlefront. The plan was relatively simple, if difficult to achieve. A port was absolutely necessary, but Allied command had decided to avoid the costly and difficult challenge of taking an occupied port. They would be heavily defended, and any attack would very likely damage the facilities anyway. So the invasion force was to do in the blink of an eye what it would otherwise take years to accomplish. They would construct two ports the size of the port of Dover in just three days. All of the pieces used to construct these ports were prefabricated in England, sunk in harbours to hide them, then refloated in preparation to be towed across the channel. These pop-up harbours were designed to be built in stages, with the breakwaters having been deposited at the five beachheads on June 7th. That was all part of Trentonian's duty in Normandy when she arrived with the corncob convoys. These breakwaters were then reinforced with the massive concrete caissons code-named Phoenixes. Bombardons were 200 feet long floating breakwaters made of steel towed across the channel and combined with floating pontoons called spud pierheads, which were 200 feet long and 60 feet wide. These had retractable legs that would be anchored in the seafloor. Everything was secured to the bottom using newly designed kite anchors with long floating bridge sections called whales spanning the sea from the platform to shore. This way ships could unload supplies directly onto the floating pier and they could be brought to land quickly which would limit the chance of attack from air or sea. After delivering their third charge to the coast of Normandy, Harrison received orders to Portsmouth to take on fuel and they arrived back to the English harbour just after 2000, where the crew was ordered to stand down. During the stand down, Lieutenant West had time for a complete survey of the sick bay and her stock. As he remarked about how well organised it was, I did see him glance toward the back where my dark room line was strung, but he didn't ask me to take it down. Lieutenant West ordered medicines, instruments for minor surgery, and assorted other supplies so we were equipped for more advanced medical procedures than I could have ever provided. It was reassuring to have his expertise. Over the course of the next few days, Trentonian made more escort trips. 
one to a staging point off the English coast, and one to take mulberries to the French coast. It was on the way back to France that Trentonian lost her first crew member. Able Seaman O'Brien's health had been deteriorating since the fuel spill. He had been losing weight and started experiencing seizures. Early in the morning of June 24th, the little dog suffered a massive seizure and died shortly thereafter. The crew was hit hard by the passing of the little dog. Since joining the ship upon their first arrival in British waters, he had been a spunky source of great joy and happiness. The men gathered together on deck. O'Brien's little body had been wrapped and sewn into the hammock he had slept in. Arthur Slater, his handler, carried the tiny bundle to the railing, and O'Brien was buried at sea. A lot of us had dogs, and O'Brien had become as good a friend to us as our own pups were back home. A lot of men came up on deck to say goodbye. It was a terribly sad moment. The men had a, I hesitate to say, a, a service, a goodbye for the dog O'Brien. I attended, of course, and uh, alongside them. Strange things happen to men at war, but in my mind, treating the dog like a member of the crew and then giving it a proper send-off, that's understandable. He was a member of our crew. By June 27th, Trentonium was back in Portsmouth Harbour, having made another trip to the French coast. It was announced with great joy that shore leave was to commence in two rounds, their first since May 22nd. Two men were returned in handcuffs charged with disorderly conduct after having tried to borrow a trolley, and two officers fell off the gangway and into the sea, having had one too many drinks to board safely. The following morning, Harrison dismissed the charges against the ratings, chalking it up to youthful exuberance and too much fun after a long period of continuous work. Harrison also received new orders that morning, and Trentonian sailed for Dungeness, near the Thames Estuary, at 1338. Operations at Portsmouth were now concluded, and Trentonian's new base of operations would be in Sheerness. This put the ship and her crew in the heart of what was the most dangerous place in the world for ships at the time, the Straits of Dover. As we entered the strait for the first time, a German V-1 bomb went screaming by overhead. I remember Jack Harold grabbing his binoculars as the thing came barreling out of the cloud cover, and he explained that it was a rocket propelled. None of us believed him at the time. When we heard later that they were indeed rockets, he dishes out a few more I told you so's. Two Spitfires shot it out of the sky. It hit the ocean and exploded like thunder, throwing just a horrendous torrent of water up. And that was the first clear indication we had just how dangerous the strait could be. Five days later, on July 10th, Trentonian had been refurbished and was adorned with a new paint job featuring a large dark wave stretching back from the bow to the forecastle. They moved out of the basin and secured to a buoy in the harbour of Sheerness. I took the opportunity to write Miss Farley in Trenton. Earlier that morning, a package had arrived with her handwriting across the label. Inside, the men found a gramophone and a parcel of records as well from the grade 10 class. I had already allowed the men to connect the radio to five speakers placed around the ship. And now the gramophone was wired through as well. I knew it would give Miss Farley a real joy to imagine the men relaxing to the records donated by the citizens of Trenton. I also informed her of my plan to broadcast music later that evening from the masked speaker, that our neighboring ships might also enjoy some music. With much thanks, I also ask that she please tell the students how greatly the crew appreciated the records. For the next two and a half weeks, Trentonian would make numerous crossings of the channel. Although there was certainly some monotony in these escorts, the threat of danger was constant. On more than one occasion, an Aztec operator would make a contact in the water and a depth charge was dropped on the point of contact. But the threats didn't end at the surface. 
One night we found ourselves directly below point where British shore batteries were intercepting V1s. An order went out to the crew that no one was allowed on deck without their helmet. And of course that had nearly everyone grabbing their lids and hitting the stairs. A lot of the men were on the deck when the shell from the English shore battery came streaking within 50 feet of the funnel. It was streaking like a banshee. It exploded in the sea about 50 yards from the port beam. A huge plume of water came blasting within the air. The men opted not to stick around, and the deck was practically clear before the shell even exploded. You never forget the sound of something that deadly, that close to you, and you sure don't stick around if you don't have to. On July 30th at 1355, Trentonian once again departed Sheerness for South End, and from there made the one-hour crossing to France with Mulberries in tow. On this crossing, the ship was fired on by German rail guns on the occupied French coast, and Trentonian laid a smoke screen to shield the convoy. The stokers, like Coates and Keir, worked down in the engine room. Gibbons and the other ASDIC operators listened intently to the sea. Taft and his men prepared the meals. The ship ran with the smoothness and efficiency that only repetition and experience could bring. The final orders during this period found Trentonian arriving in Milford Haven at 16.45 on August 8, 1944. This would be their new base of operations as part of the 41st Escort Group and mark the end of Trentonian's involvement in the invasion period. Over the previous eight weeks, Trentonian and her crew had escorted more than 22 convoys and had worked through extensive periods of continuous activity, earning Trentonian the battle honor Normandy 1944. The first convoys were in support of the invasion force, so they were large and carried as much material as possible to coordinate the landing with as much force as possible. What was needed now were smaller convoys to provide a steady stream of supplies to the battlefield. Our role also changed. Our prime directive was getting our convoys to their destinations. If a U-boat was discovered, we were to protect the convoy while destroyers and frigates would move in to hunt the sub. After two days rest, Trentonian sailed from Milford Haven with 37 merchant ships and two familiar escorts. Moose Jaw, a corvette that Trentonian had worked with extensively, and Lunenburg, Lieutenant Harrison's old assignment. I had just left the deck where I'd been taking photos. The mess bell rang and men gathered to have supper. And boy, was there ever a lot of chatter. Apparently a Canadian escort group had sunken two U-boats. And there was bad news too. A minesweeper, Alberni, was torpedoed while working along the Normandy approach channels. Their call to dinner had just rang, so most of the men were below deck in the messes. The ship sunk in 20 seconds and 59 men went with her. I could hardly believe it. 20 seconds? Just 20 seconds and they were gone. The ship was rarely at dock, but tied up alongside two other vessels. So the three were triple parked. Harrison allowed for shore leave. This inspired those who were granted leave to bring something back for the men whom they knew would not be permitted leave before new orders were given. They liberated a keg from a local pub and rolled it back to the ships in broad daylight. The noise was heard across the docks, and men from both ships tied between Trentonian and the dock workers assisted in rolling the keg out to Trentonian's deck. What a racket they made. And then someone came out with a fire axe. They took one swipe at the keg, and it was then they realized they should have let it settle. The air was filled with a spray of beer foam as high as a spout from a depth charge. Men grabbed anything they could to hold some suds. Most everyone got some, although no one got much. For weeks on end, the men of Trentonian had worked like the gears of a well-oiled machine. The Aztec operators swept the water, underwater ears tuned into every acoustic signal in an attempt to find a submarine needle in a vast ocean haystack. Mission after mission occurred without incident. Naval command would assign them an escort, they'd deliver the convoy and receive new orders. 
then a day or two in Milford Haven, and then hoist anchor, do it all again. Of course I knew the men wanted to get ashore in France, and with our next escort mission scheduled for the following day, there was opportunity. I allowed half the crew in the morning, for four hours, and the other half, four hours in the afternoon. I set down very specific instructions. No one was to purchase or accept any wine or spirits from anyone. Cafes were to be avoided, and the men would travel in large groups at all times. Not only was there some concern that enemy soldiers could still be in operation, as Cherbourg had been occupied by the Germans, but French sympathizers had been rumored to be poisoning the alcohol of Allied soldiers. Lieutenant Harrison also ordered Stoker Norman Sharp and several other ratings who had initially begun the war in service of the Canadian Army to run shore patrol. They were given rifles and instructions to keep an eye on their shipmates. I was excited to get some photos of Cherbourg. I took quite a few of the destruction, the empty streets, the cathedral, and some German POWs. That was the first time we'd actually seen the enemy in the flesh. A truck of prisoners drove past us. It was eerie. Their faces were blank. They looked exhausted. They looked like us. After their first French shore leave early next morning, Trentonian returned to her home port in Milford Haven. Convoys remained small but regular, often consisting of just one corvette as escort. And the ship was assigned to a familiar duty, transporting the large cement caissons known as phoenixes. Only this trip would prove very different from all the rest. Oh, Phoenix 194. I'll never forget that ordeal. We just survived a small storm and had to leave harbor due to the weather. But little did we know what the Atlantic was brewing up for us. The ship left harbor on October 15th, escorting two tugs, Saucy and Hesperia, both towing a Phoenix, number 194. Each Phoenix also carried a few men atop them with a tent for a shelter. By shortly after midnight on October 17th, sea conditions had deteriorated so significantly they had to seek shelter. Harrison ordered the convoy to the leeward side of Lundy Island, but many other ships had sheltered there and Hesperia was forced to anchor away from the others as Saucy's tow line was too long for the harbour they cast off and made for shelter. Hesperia remained out of the wind's shadow, which caused the vessel to get caught up in their own tow line as the tide came in, swinging the giant caisson around the tug. Hesperia was forced to draw anchor and drift while getting their tow line untangled. By morning, Hesperia and Phoenix 194 were 12 miles from the island and the rest of the convoy, and the storm had worsened Waves were 30 feet high with winds of 60 miles per hour. By the time Saucy had caught up to assist Hesperia, they couldn't attach their own tow line. Waves were breaking halfway up the forward side of the concrete caisson, making the operation impossible. I have never had so much difficulty at sea. That caisson and those winds were hell. It was a dangerous operation as men connected tow lines in whipping wind and spray. A line would get attached, we'd move at a snail's distance, and the line would part again. As the weather once again deteriorated, I ordered the men off the Phoenix. With skillful and courageous ship handling, they had endeavored to secure the casing over 38 hours of the most horrendous conditions with nothing but a tent to protect them. Their work was done. Trentonian steamed west to meet the Dutch tug Hudson, which had been sent out with extra tow lines and extra crew to man the caisson. And by late afternoon of October 19th, the convoy was once again bound for the French coast. Their success was short-lived. The caisson began to list at 15 degrees. The Trentonian's whaler was sent to retrieve the crew manning the Phoenix. Lines were cut, and the concrete caisson sank to the bottom of the sea. Although the Phoenix was lost, Rear Admiral Fairbairn 
commended Harrison for the manner in which he carried out his arduous duty to carry on the escort in circumstances of very considerable difficulty. October 27th at 12.55, a messenger boarded upon arrival to inform them that Admiral Fairbairn would be conducting an inspection that afternoon. Well, that was it. The order went out and the men jumped to to make ready for inspection. We didn't have long and there was plenty to do. The last two weeks had been very busy, very stressful, and what with the storm we were in, a little disarray. Men scrubbed the ship and themselves. Razors were broken out and shirts were ironed. I was really proud of the crew. Their courage, their work ethic, their professionalism. The ratings really came together. The ship looked great. The Admiral and his men made their way around the ship inspecting the vessel and speaking with the men. Upon completion of the inspection, Fairbairn and Harrison retired to the Lieutenant's cabin, where the Admiral once again praised Harrison and the crew for the extreme efforts undertaken with the Phoenix. Then the Admiral's party made their way back to the rail. After the success of the inspection and the praise given by the Admiral, Harrison ordered the spirit locker opened and two beers handed out to each man. I was lucky enough to meet Admiral Fairburn during the inspection and asked his permission for a photograph. He was more than happy to pose for me. I also took the opportunity to take photographs of the crew in our number ones. We didn't wear them except for shore leave, which meant we were never all dressed up at the same time. So it was a rare chance to capture the whole crew looking our best. Lieutenant Harrison wrote a letter to Hazel Farley, filling her in on the latest news and wishing her and the citizens of Trenton a happy Christmas. Every time I received a letter from Lieutenant Harrison, I was overjoyed. News of our boys. The people of Trenton had done so much for the crew, and those boys were on our minds all the time. But even more so as Christmas Day approached. Of course, I shared it with the volunteers, filling them in on the news. With my last letter, I had included a list of things en route from us all here in Trenton. And Lieutenant Harrison told us again we were spoiling them, which always made me smile. He did mention the weather had been a bit miserable and how much the crew appreciated our magazines. Oh, 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 and he wished us all a very Merry Christmas. Over the next month, Trentonian would perform numerous escorts across the channel and survived another storm that sunk an Allied trawler, Transvaal, which lost 19 crew members. Also during this time, the corvette Schwinnigan was torpedoed by a German submarine and sank. There were no survivors in her crew of 91. Trentonian was stationed in Milford Haven, these escorts would travel around the southern spur of the English coast between the Bristol Channel all the way through the Strait of Dover to the Thames Estuary at London. One might think this was safer than a channel crossing, but the area was still incredibly dangerous. Enemy e-boats, aircraft and of course German submarines were still active in the area. Coastal travel also presented its own challenges to the Aztec operators. Oh, it was like nothing out in the channel, where you'd go for a while without hearing a thing. But the coast pinged out false positives everywhere. Wrecks on the seafloor, rock spurs coming off the bottom, shifting layers of water temperature. Luckily, we had a load of experience dealing with false pings. It really kept us operators on our ears, so to speak. On December 16th, several parcels had arrived for the ship including one very large crate. We could hardly believe it as they lugged the crate up onto the deck. The men crowded around to see. Harrison was there too, with a wry smile on his face. I think he knew. As the lid was pried off the crate, I heard a cheer go up from the men around. It was the clothes washing machine. You should have seen the shipping manifest. The damn thing had left Canada long before, and then spent many months following behind us to ports all along the coast, where we had been stationed. Guess it finally caught up. The washing machine had finally arrived just in time for Christmas, and was installed and immediately put to use by the crew. 
However, not everyone took advantage. It was a neat thing, all right, and the people of Trenton were really so very good to us. But you know something? That mill can work better, and a few of us kept on using that. The citizens of Trenton had also included gifts for the men for the holiday, chocolate, writing kits, and things like wallets. Harrison sent a cable to Trenton on December 20th, stating, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from the ship's company. Red Cross parcels also arrived at this time, one for each crew member. These held various foodstuffs. Trentonian received orders to sail for the Thames with a convoy on December 21st. The trip, taking about five days, meant the crew would be spending Christmas Day at sea. They resigned themselves to the task at hand. But as the convoy rounded Land's End on the southern coast, new orders were given to detach from the convoy and returned to Bristol Channel alongside Moose Jaw, escorting another group back to Bristol. That made a lot of the men happy. It meant we would be in our home port for Christmas Day. Trentonian and Moose Jaw sailed into the Bristol Channel, discharged their convoy, and anchored in Milford Haven at 0445 on December 24th, whereupon the men began to ready the ship for the holiday. Everything they could find to give the ship a sense of festivities was hung in the messes as decoration. Later that day, Harrison received orders to sail for another convoy. But according to the crew, the skipper refused, stating that his men were going to have a Christmas holiday. The messes were where everybody gabbed about everything, kind of like a kitchen is back home, always filled with talk, rumors, news. Sometimes it was thick as navy gravy in there. Well, the talk Christmas Eve was all about how Harrison refused the, the order to sail out, how he made a stand for the crew in the face of command. Whether it was true or not, didn't seem to matter. The men seem to think that Harrison refused a direct order. I doubt that very much, uh, that that's what happened. Although, I wouldn't put it past them to negotiate for an additional day off. No matter the details, Trentonian was allowed to remain in harbour for Christmas Day. Celebration was cut short, however, when Harrison once again received orders to lift anchor. At 23.40, Trentonian left the harbour at speed. Orders were received in the engine room around 10.30 to leave the harbour at full speed, which isn't normal procedure, but stokers followed orders. We churned up a lot of water as we left. Other escorts had been in harbour longer than Trentonian, and Harrison showed his displeasure at forcing his men back to work before them by rocking a number of sailors awake in those vessels. Trentonian picked up their next convoy at Barry Roads at 06.30 on December 26th, arriving back on January the 2nd without incident. Boiler cleaning commenced again, and the men enjoyed another extended shore leave. At this time, Harrison caught himself up on paperwork and also contacted Hazel Farley again. I decided it would be a good time to take stock of all that Miss Farley and the citizens of Trenton had sent us. It was a formidable list. I was also aware that we were very well looked after. Many other adoptive vessels had received quite a splash initially and then interest had died off. We were still regular recipients of the generosity of the citizens of Trenton, and they needed to hear our appreciation. When I read the list included in Lieutenant Harrison's letter, I couldn't believe how much we had actually sent along. 80 wallets, 75 woolen socks, 80 writing kits, mittens, records, 32,000 cigarettes. A short mission to aid a merchant ship that had caught fire was completed successfully and the damaged vessel was towed to harbour. On January 21st, Trentonian departed Milford Haven for Sheerness with a convoy of 14 ships. On arriving in Sheerness three days later, a communication was waiting for Lieutenant Harrison. News of the contents of the message travelled quickly through the ship causing pride and sadness both. For Lieutenant Harrison had been promoted to Lieutenant Commander, 
but this also brought a new assignment, also effective immediately. He was to depart Trentonian and take command of HMCS Joliet, a river-class frigate, upon return to Milford Haven. Of course, this necessitated a final letter from Lieutenant Harrison to Miss Farley. It was exceedingly difficult to write that final letter. Since first meeting Miss Farley in Trenton, I considered her a friend. She had gone to such lengths to attend to us and drum up the support of the community for the crew. I read that letter with some regret that our official connection was broken, but as war so often does, relationships are made and broken by necessity. I replied with the full support of the community of Trenton and wishing him all the best aboard Joliet. Most of the crew of Joliet spoke French, and Harrison signed off his final letter to Trenton's favorite French teacher with the line, Au revoir, just to get into practice. The respect the crew felt for their skipper was immense. Harrison had been there for their training, the first Atlantic convoys, the dangers off Normandy, the friendly fire attack where he positioned the ship to save the lives of the cable crew from the Americans, the German buzz bombs. He had always fought for the crew and been light on punishment when necessary. They felt an immense loyalty to him and he had made every effort to keep his original crew. Giving temporary command to Lieutenant Kinsman, Harrison walked across the deck for the last time. As he was piped down the gangway, the men who had gathered along the rail to say goodbye began to cheer. Harrison saluted them all before taking his last step and debarking Trentonian for the very last time, departed from our story. I gave Harrison some photos before he left. Everyone was on deck for his departure. We'd all grown to love him like a father, even though he wasn't all that older than us. Some of the men even wiped at their eyes. I have to admit, the ship felt different after he left. But maybe it wasn't the same. Lieutenant Colin S. Glasgow, Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve, arrived on January 31st to take over his new command of Trentonian. Glasgow had been stationed aboard Ville de Quebec, since July 1943. February 1st found the crew grumbling as the order came down to make ready to leave as they donned their life jackets. Under heavy fog, Trentonian slipped away from Milford Haven under her new command, leading convoy BTC-56, and returned to Milford Haven bearing another convoy alongside HMCS Moose Jaw. There was a meeting held on the morning of February 21st at the FOIC in Milford Haven. Lieutenant Glasgow and the skipper of Moose Jaw were informed that an escort was needed that only required one ship. Both men offered their vessel for the mission and after some friendly debate, it was decided that a coin toss would determine which ship performed the escort. Glasgow won that toss and so returned to Trentonian to order men to stations to get underway. There weren't many of us that liked that story. I don't know who brought it back to the ship, but, well, we'd been here all along and had nothing to prove. So our commander wanted to stand out, maybe? I don't know. But really? A coin toss? Bad. Bad. You don't do that in these situations. A coin toss? It's like thumbing your nose at fate. I have to admit, it did give a bunch of us an uneasy feeling. Lieutenant Harrison wouldn't have done that, I'm sure of it. Trentonian departed Milford Haven and joined her charges at 1730 in the Bristol Channel on February 21st. Convoy BTC-76 was composed of 12 small coastal trawlers and two large Liberty ships, arranged in two columns with the Liberty ships in the lead. Travelling at a speed of seven knots, the convoy left for Antwerp with Trentonian screening the columns ahead of them. 
Bad omens were left behind as the men began to imagine themselves in port in Belgium. The channel was clear and calm, and visibility was perfect on the day it all ended. Radar sat on standby as the ASDIC operators performed a sweep of the sea. Trentonian led the convoy, tracking its familiar zigzag motion at the front of the column. The afternoon watch had just taken their stations with lunch in their bellies. The forenoon watch had just finished their midday meal and were relaxing below deck. Gordon Gibbons was in the communication mess. I had just laid out on one of the benches in the mess when I felt it. The whole ship rumbled as a shockwave ran through the water. And it was close. U-Boat 1004 was a Type VIIC 41 U-Boat, built for Nazi Germany's Kriegsmarine for service during World War II. Part of the 11th Flotilla, it operated mainly in the North Sea, and against the Russian convoys in the Arctic Sea. Trentonian's convoy was sailing directly through its southern waters. The German communication officers would have heard the convoy from miles away. At 1320, under a clear sky, a massive explosion shredded the calm of the afternoon. The SS Alexander Kennedy. Flames and fragments flew through the air, she had been torpedoed. Lieutenant Abbott had just taken command of the afternoon watch. He immediately ordered all watertight doors sealed and called the men to action stations. As he ordered Trentonian turn to port to come around the side of the convoy, Lieutenant Glasgow arrived on the bridge, took a report from Abbott and resumed the lieutenant's actions, continuing the turn to port. Glasgow sent a message to the next vessel in the column the Walter Christensen, asking on which side the Kennedy had been struck. The message returned starboard. Trentonian cut their turn to cross through the convoy from port to starboard in an attempt to find the contact with ASDIC. Glasgow ordered a depth charge ready as Trentonian passed through the column at full speed. They had just cleared the convoy as the clock struck 1330 and a second torpedo found its mark. Just minutes before that second strike, an operator within the U-boat might have heard the whine of Trentonian's engines as she made her turn and sped through the column. The commander might also have recognized this as an escort ship to the attack. Another torpedo was immediately ready, like a Zaunkonik, called a Nat by the British, short for the German Navy Acoustic Torpedo. These underwater weapons had a range of 5,000 meters and were fired from a distance of at least 400 meters, whereupon an acoustic sensor inside the device would target in on the loudest noise in the water, which on this day meant a Royal Navy Corvette traveling at full speed. A steel door opened, flushing a tube with cold seawater, and seconds later the underwater missile was loosed into the sea. Zipping along unseen below the waves at 44 kilometers an hour, it honed in on Trentonian and slicing through the water, following the churning sound of the prop, made contact and detonated. The whole corvette shuddered as water sprayed and torn steel flew into the air. Trentonian immediately listed to starboard. Fragments and shards of metal rained down all over the deck and bridge. The engines began to race, the propeller had been blown off and the mangled remains of the screw began spinning at high speed, sending a terrible vibration through the ship. Damage to the rear of the vessel was horrendous. The aft guns were completely missing. The entire decking had been lifted by the explosion beneath it and twisted metal and debris lay all about the starboard side. Men had been thrown and tossed by the blast. Many lay dazed among the wreckage or stumbled on the tilted decking. One sailor had been killed instantly, another decapitated by the blast. One man was missing his arm, another femur had torn through his pants above his knee. Another found himself unharmed but trapped inside the ruined metal of the quarterdeck. Some men had been thrown into the water 
The ones who were conscious were thankful to have been wearing their life jackets. Lieutenant Stephen, who had been standing near where the torpedo struck, was now in the water, unconscious, with blood streaming from his head. On the bridge, Glasgow immediately ordered full stop, and Engineer Hindle in the engine room shut it down and ordered an evacuation. Sidney Coates was on duty at the time. There were three of us in the engine room. I yelled, we're sinking, get out, and we rushed for the ladder. At the top, I saw through the porthole that the deck was already submerged, the ship tilting. We heaved at the door handle, terrified it would break, and we'd drown. But it opened, and water rushed past us as we made the deck. Men moved the wounded to the rails while another crawled through the wreckage on deck to disarm the depth charges. If even one of them was missed, they would explode as the ship sank, potentially killing anyone in the water. Engineer Hindle took stock of the damage. The entire aft of the ship was in ruins and taking on water quickly. Lieutenant Glasgow gave the order to abandon ship at 1334, just four minutes after the torpedo had slammed into Trentonian. This set the crew into motion. Acting on training, they had first acquired in Bermuda, but perfected in trials since. Lieutenant Abbott grabbed code books and charts and locked them away. Some were affixed to weights and immediately sunk. Others were burned on deck. Wounded men were placed in the whaler. Those that couldn't be moved easily had life jackets affixed and were left. They attempted to save the armless sailor by placing him in a life jacket. But as he entered the water, he slipped out and vanished beneath the waves. On the quarterdeck, men had been desperately trying to free their shipmate from his prison of twisted metal. But as the water swirled around his terrified eyes and finally covered his head, choking off his screams for help, they had to leave him and swam off the sunken deck into the ocean. I couldn't release the line from one of the Carly floats. I didn't have my life jacket on having just run up from the boiler room. I was about to give up and jump in when one of the gunners ran by and tossed me one. Figures though, I jumped in the water and the float came down just missing me. I remember foolishly now, taking off my sea boots and placing them under an ammunition locker. I thought I might be able to retrieve them later. Then I jumped the rail. By God, it was a cold shock when I went under. The ship rapidly took on water, the nose continuing to climb into the air. As men were swimming off the deck at the rear of the ships, those at the nose had to jump. I was in a Carly float, soaked to the bone, but otherwise okay. Trentonian continued to list. I saw Lieutenant Dodds make his way up the rail of the forward gun deck. Pause. Look out over the waves, and would you believe it? He did a swan dive into the sea. The whaler was gained by Lieutenant Kinsman, who released it from the starboard side in a hurry to clear the rapidly sinking ship while Lieutenant Glasgow and Lieutenant Abbott, having taken one last check of the area for survivors, climbed down from the bridge and simply stepped off into the frigid waters of the English Channel, the last men to leave Trentonian. As the ship's nose rose above the men bobbing in the water and the floats, a crash accentuated by the tinkle of piano keys was followed by the pennant numbers K368, slowly slipping below the waves in a vast swirl of water and bubbles. Ten short minutes after the torpedo strike at 1340, on February 22, 1945, Her Majesty's Canadian ship Trentonian had sunk. Fifteen months of a grueling routine of service and six young lives lost, all terribly finished in ten short minutes of total destruction. Although hypothermia had begun to affect the survivors, the convoy had to carry on. Rescue had already begun in earnest as vessels were directed to the vicinity. Royal Navy motor launches ML-600 and ML-124 high-speed attack vessels used in harbour defence arrived in 20 minutes and started taking on survivors. A headcount was completed noting the lost men. Of the 95 survivors, 11 of the injured were immediately taken by ambulance to Falmouth sick quarters as soon as they docked, 
while two sailors with more serious injuries were admitted at the Royal Cornwall Infirmary in Truro. A search for the U-boat was almost immediately launched. However, a full day and a half after the attack with only one potential contact, it was called off. The Germans had escaped. The uninjured men attended a joint burial service for Lieutenant Stephen and memorial for the missing men, even though each lost sailor could be accounted for in the attack. Without bodily evidence, they were officially classified as missing. Later that day, as Lieutenant Glasgow temporarily delayed the mountain of paperwork to write letters to the families of the dead and missing, the crew left Falmouth by train for Niobe, Scotland. They had been granted survivor's leave and were being returned to Canada by ship on March 8th but not before a chance encounter in Niobe saved a rich historical record of the lost corvette Trentonian. We were all excited to get back to Canada and see our families and friends and forget about the war for a while, if we could. But there was so much loss too, not just our crewmates and our friends or the ship we called home for over a year, but all of our possessions, my photos, hundreds of my negatives went down with the ship. The crew was definitely ready to go home. We were wearing ill-fitted clothes and we had nothing to our name except for some survivor pay that was handed out as we left Falmouth. What a fluke. I ran into a stoker that had been reassigned off Trentonian just two weeks before the attack. And he'd been with us since Quebec City. He was completely shocked when I told him the news. Well, doesn't it turn out he mentions he's broke, needs some cash? And didn't he just have the best thing possible to sell to me? Almost 200 of Singleton's photos! When Bruce came in with that bundle, I was stunned. I couldn't believe my luck. That's when I realized there were many more photographs out there, because I had sold and given so many to crewmates who had left the ship. An official board of inquiry was called in Plymouth. They found the crew had acted appropriately and that the circumstances leading to the sinking of Trentonian required no disciplinary action. On March 15th, the able-bodied survivors of the HMCS Trentonian landed in Halifax, where some of the men lived. The rest began to disperse back across the country by train, eager to see family and begin their survivors' leave. There were heartfelt goodbyes all along our route. Men get off in New Brunswick and Quebec, and before the last stop in Toronto, there weren't many of us left. It was surreal. All these friends, almost like family members, and all of it was over. I boarded a train for Saskatoon and waved the last of the men on the platform. As much as I was looking forward to home, I was also sad. I was going to miss those guys. News of Trentonian's loss was released on March 26, 1945. Mayor Corey, Hazel Farley and the people of Trenton learned the fate of their ship at the same time as the rest of Canada through the official press release. Mayor Corey ordered the flags of Trenton lowered to half-mast to honour the men who had been killed in the attack. Oh, it was terrible news. We had gotten to know them through our letters, a lot of us, and the kids at the high school. It was something you always knew could happen, but didn't ever think about. And then all I could think about was those six poor boys and the sacrifice they had made for all of us. Our six lost boys. On the morning of March 28, 1945, Mayor H.R. Corey sat down at his desk at Trenton City Hall, holding his first order of business of the day, a letter. He knew what news he was holding. All of Trenton knew by now. But though he hesitated, he opened the envelope addressed to him from the Department of National Defense for Naval Services. He read the official news and the final paragraph. The department takes this opportunity to express its sincere thanks for the kindness and generosity of the good people of Trenton in providing for the comfort and welfare of the crew of this corvette. Mayor Corey set the letter down on his desk and walked across the room. He looked out the windows at the city of Trenton. 
out past where the flag at half-mast riffled in a strong spring breeze. In Europe, the war was approaching the end. In the English Channel, a corvette lay ruined on the seabed. But here, in Trenton, Ontario, Canada, the spirit of the community and the legacy of a ship named after it remained unsinkable. Roll along, baby, baby, roll along.